20 years ago, a man called Cornell Haynes Jr. famously said, It's getting hot in here, so, hot. so take off all your clothes. But how hot is it? And how does it compare with Earth's past? Let's find out. The first question of how hot it currently is, is relatively straightforward to answer. Like the three decades before it, last decade was the warmest since thermometer records began, clocking off at over 1 degree Celsius above the temperatures of the pre-industrial period. But so what? 1 degree doesn't sound like much, and the temperature in your house probably changes by more than that every day. Except we're not talking about local temperature here. We're talking about the average temperature of the whole planet, and even small changes can have huge impacts on climate. For example, 6 degrees Celsius is all that stands between us and the peak of the last ice age. And while it took about 10,000 years for those 6 degrees of warming to occur, it has now warmed by 1 degree in less than a century, over 10 times faster. Suddenly, it doesn't seem quite so insignificant, does it? And the fact that the Earth is on track to reach 3 degrees this century seems a lot scarier. This is fine. But this isn't the first time the Earth has heated up. In fact, the Earth has been much hotter than today many times in the distant past. For example, during the Cretaceous when T. rex was gallivanting around. Because of this fact, you'll often hear climate contrarians claim that because it's been much hotter in the past, current warming is nothing to worry about. But the problem with this argument should be clear to anyone who's actually stopped to think about it. Wait a minute. Clearly, a T-Rex would struggle to survive in much of the modern world, devoid as it is of most of the lush, hot and humid ecosystems it adapted to. Similarly, human civilization, with its agricultural systems carefully tuned to the stable and cool climate of the Holocene, would unravel pretty quickly if the planet returned to the conditions of the Cretaceous. A world with no ice, sea levels over a hundred meters higher, and millions of massive murderous lizards stomping around. Let's just say it would be difficult to grow wheat. Do you see that? Clearly, there are temperature limits to the kind of climate that humans and agriculture can survive in. But this begs the question, how much heat can we handle? Can you handle this? Well, the short answer is we don't really know, but scientists suggest that we should try to keep temperatures within the range that agriculture has adapted to, because, you know, having food is pretty important. If we don't, we'll be taking civilization into completely uncharted territory, which probably isn't a good idea. So how do modern conditions compare with the past, and are current temperatures within the limits of what agriculture has experienced before? In short, when was it last this hot? To answer this, we have to delve into an area of science called paleoclimatology, which is a fancy word for the study of past climates. Because we don't have detailed climate records extending into the geologic past, paleoclimate scientists behave like detectives, piecing together clues about past climate change. These clues are called climate proxies, and include things like tree rings, fossils and ice cores. In 2013, the IPCC Fifth Assessment Report used these proxies to look at the last 2000 years, a period for which we have very detailed data. They concluded that current temperatures are the hottest in at least the last 1400 years, which means that humans and agriculture may have experienced hotter temperatures before that. So case closed. Modern temperatures aren't particularly exceptional, and humans have survived them before, right? Wrong. Unfortunately, a lot has changed since 2013. On the plus side, songs making light of consent don't become smash hits anymore. But on the downside, the world is now hotter than ever, and not in a good way. In 2013, global warming sat at 0.8 degrees above the pre-industrial period. Now it's at 1.1 degrees, which is warmer than any point in the entire 2000 year period the IPCC looked at in 2013. In other words, it's warmed so much in just 10 years that conclusions drawn by the IPCC in 2013 are now completely out of date. 
This means we have to look even further back to find similar temperatures. But that's where we run into problems with the data. The further back in time we look, the worse the data resolution becomes. Think of it like an image on a screen. Modern data is high resolution, it's crisp and clear, and we can easily distinguish between individual months, years and decades. But as we go back in time, the resolution of the picture becomes lower and lower, and the data begins to become blurry. And beyond the last 2000 years, the data from individual years and decades quickly becomes Essentially, the temperature record becomes too fuzzy to see clearly. A real dilemma, if ever I saw one. This makes it impossible to fairly compare modern data, which distinguishes between years and decades, with data from the past, which records temperatures averaged over centuries. We have to find another approach, and that's exactly what scientists have done. So far, we've been trying to find out when it was last this hot, but because the data from the past is so blurry, we can't make a fair comparison with present temperatures. We simply can't turn the blurry, low-resolution images of the past into the sharp, high-resolution images that we have for the present. But what if we did the opposite? What if we turned the crisp images of the present into blurry images like those of the past? I know, it all sounds a bit abstract, but hear me out. Since 2013, scientists' knowledge of long-term processes in the climate system have become much better. We now have a far greater understanding of how the short-term year-to-year changes in climate that we observe today will play out over the decades and centuries to come. Now, obviously, there are still uncertainties, but these uncertainties are largely around human behaviour rather than how the climate works. So while we don't know how much more CO2 we will emit, we do have a pretty good understanding of how it will affect the atmosphere once it's up there. This means that we can project modern warming centuries into the future for each possible emission scenario. So how does this help us? Well, if we want to know when it was last this hot, we need to find a comparable period of warmth in the past. But our current warm period is only about a century long, and we can't see individual centuries that far back, so it's impossible to see if there was a comparable period of warmth. But now, because we can project into the future, we can calculate the average temperature of, say, the 400 years between 1900 and 2300. And suddenly, we don't need to look for a single century anymore. We just need to find a comparable period of 400 years. So let's take the most optimistic scenario, which assumes decisive climate action and rapid emission reductions. The IPCC concludes that under this best case scenario, temperatures will level out and stabilise at around 1.2 degrees above the pre-industrial for the next few centuries, which is more or less equivalent to the temperatures of the last decade. So when was it last this hot? Well, according to the latest analysis, at no point in at least the last 120,000 years has the Earth seen temperatures this warm. And since human agriculture is at most a few thousand years old, this is the hottest period in the history of human civilization. We are already in uncharted territory. And remember, this is just the best case scenario. If we don't act to mitigate climate change, temperatures could average 4.1 degrees over the next few centuries, temperatures which haven't been experienced in literally millions of years. Can our civilization survive in those conditions? I'd rather not have to find out. So Cornell was right. It is indeed getting hot in here, but taking off your clothes is at best a temporary solution. If we want to avoid a future which threatens our existence, we need to get to net zero as fast as possible. And if you want to find out how we can do that, then check out Earth Rescue, the new series I'm hosting on the ANSYS YouTube channel. And before you go, I just wanted to give a huge thanks to paleoclimate scientist Professor Daryl Kaufman of NAU, who suggested this topic and provided the research for this video. I couldn't have done this without him. Anyway, that's enough from me. Thanks for watching, and until next time, goodbye.